Welcome back, viewers and listeners. It is now 7.03 in the capital of paradise, which we will not be leaving anytime soon because we have no boat and there are no planes either. On set with us is Mr. Martin George. Mr. Mm -hmm. George, good morning and welcome. Hi, good morning to you and good to morning to your viewers and good morning to Bego. And I must say I am so grateful that I did not try to take the ferry to come up this morning <laughs> because I understand the ferry was loaded with passengers, loaded with people, loaded with trucks and goods, and the ferry what did the... not depart the port. It was stuck in the port of Port of Spain. Mr. George, let me take a first bite. And I, when I heard that you were coming, in fact, when we, I spoke to the producer this morning, I said, good, we're going to have good conversation. <laughs> because I, and I say, any orator, I love to hear great orators, and you're one of them. Right. Okay. Now let's talk to, we have, I want to, we go into the judiciary, we were speaking to that earlier. We'll get to that. But let us uh, get your perspective as what really is happening with this port scenario. I mean, clearly uh, what we have been seeing here is, um, we have never seen this before. What is happening? Why is this happening to, to us here in Tobago? Well, the thing is, I have heard Mr. Michael Anaset um, on television, and he has given quite an interesting on this very spin scenario. on this mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. He has basically suggested that this has been in the works yes. for some time. Yes. He says that they at the port were aware of certain developments. Mm -hmm. So it makes you wonder sometimes that things are not always what they appear to be. Very good. In other words, what you're seeing is basically a total collapse and breakdown of the management system of the ferry service between Trinidad and Tobago. And I think we have to ask ourselves sensible and reasonable questions. Is this all coincidence? Hmm. In other words, is it something that... <laughs> has just no, I know conspired Murphy to happen get, by Murphy's law that everything is breaking down at the same time. You ask yourself about Bay Ferries. Mm -hmm. That's the Canadian company that used to manage. You know, ask yourself about that. Ask yourself about which company has replaced them. Mm -hmm. You ask yourself in terms of who are the persons behind the barge and the Atlantic provider. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to connect the dots, the same way in America with the Russia-Trump scenario, when you connect oh, the dots, it's... Russia. All inescapable as hmm. to the conclusion. I think we have to start asking ourselves these questions. But and Mr. George, nobody. Okay, so we identify the problem that would have contributed. We identify what is the, the core of the problem. Hmm. Who is to be reprimanded? Who in this country nobody is punished for anything? Everybody does the or do the, the, the evil to use a, a term that Yolanda would like me to use and walks <laughs> away scotch free, happy and dry, and they laugh at us at the end of the day. Uh, if we can identify the culprits that would have contributed to this this disaster, this 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 crisis that we have faced, how do we how do we treat with that? Well, that's the thing. In Trinidad and Tobago, we don't have a history of really pursuing these things. I mean, you have things like I mean, even fiascos like what would have happened with you know the, the whole call the heart scenario Good. and things like that. And, and if you're lucky, no, you get a section thirty four in your waist. <laughs> this is the point. And Change you know, no, nobody has been held responsible for these things. Mm. So therefore, it's difficult for us to say, well, look, we are going to hope that something is going to happen differently now. But the thing is, we have to reach a point as citizens where we start calling upon our leaders to account and to be responsible. And I'll tell you why. Because what has happened for decades in Trinidad and Tobago, we've been divided, you know, by party lines. And mm -hmm. as a result, persons who are members Absolutely. of a party or supporters of a party feel that they cannot criticize, they cannot say anything. Now, if you look at Tobago in particular, Tobago yes. has been hamstrung by that. Mm -hmm. Whenever Tobago is led by an administration that is the same administration as what is in central government, you realize Tobago gets the worst treatment, Tobago mm -hmm. suffers the most when that happens wow. because you cannot criticize your party oh and that's goodness. the difficulty we've but had not in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, no, even constructive it's, criticism uh -huh. is not allowed so because it is viewed as criticism. Okay. They, they, they don't look at the constructive aspect of it. They okay. shoot the messenger. Okay. They don't bother to analyze My the message. Goodness. And that's the that's a challenge we've had over the years in Trinidad and Tobago. And unless we, as Tobagonians, recognize that, we will realize that we are going to be stuck in this construct for years and years to come. That's the reality well, of listen, politics in Trinidad and Tobago. I always say one thing. You see, if I vote for you, You'll hear my mouth the loudest. <laughs> because to me, 
I signed on that dotted line that hired you to carry out our business. And that's how I look at it. And citizens, like, even with this boat issue, I'm sitting here just before you came on set and said, this thing seems weirdly orchestrated. I mean, it seems like everything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong. Yeah. No. Now I now I mean, you are so, so we, we are virtually cut off now. Right. You have no cargo vessel, no. Mm -hmm. and the two fast ferries are out of service. Exactly. I mean, and let us so not how so we can are Tobago is supposed to function? I mean, I am actually thinking that this is a scenario where I mean, I certainly will be speaking with members of the chamber. In fact, I travelled up this morning with one member, and we were discussing the concept of the businessmen in Tobago getting together and us looking at filing a constitutional motion mm -hmm. because it, it's a fundamental constitution. <laughs> right, your freedom of movement. Yes. If we it's don't continued. have that, mm -hmm. yeah. and you see, it's particularly essential for Tobagonians. Mm -hmm. Whereas you may have persons coming up from Trinidad or other places on vacation or to relax or whatever, so maybe they might view this as a minor irritant or an mm -hmm. inconvenience. For Tobagonians, it's life and death. Mm -hmm. People have to go down for court, they have to go down for interviews, they have to go down for school, they have yes. to go down for medical purposes, mm -hmm. you know. So therefore, we, we, we can't play with these things. We, we can't afford to sit back and be apathetic and, you know, just, you know, say, well, you know, this is Tobago. Yeah, we, we, we need to move beyond that because I tell you, it's quite possible to have a nice idyllic lifestyle and still be very first world and professional in how you treat Beautiful. with your basic goods and services. Yes. Now, Martin, I want to I wanna treat with something. I would like to get your opinion <laughs> on this. When we, you, like Brother V just said, look, let's get together, let's buy a ferry. Let's do something, because it doesn't seem like the government could get it right, basically. Right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Coach, you right? And he had right. made some suggestion in the past about seaplane and all that. Right. Go ahead. I, Go ahead. Right. Yes, But Go ahead, the thing is, but right. we, we must be careful mm. in analyzing these things to ensure that we do not relieve the government of their fundamental responsibility. responsibility. Okay. So in other words, mm -hmm. it can't be that you, the elected government, are failing repeatedly in your basic duty, and then you're saying, well, what is the private sector doing? That's not the way. Okay. In other words, you are supposed to take the lead. Mm -hmm. And when you take the lead, the private sector will pick up the slack and follow. Okay. But you cannot tell a private sector organization yes. to run yes. a ferry service yes. between Trinidad and Tobago. You know, because let me tell you, people, people I, I have heard people bandying around these ideas. Listen. When you talk about, first of all, just talk about the unions. Hmm. Dealing with the unions at the port, hmm. right? Dealing with the longshoremen, right? The, the, the loaders, the, you, you know, listen, it is... Uh, it's a, it's a mammoth whole... undertaking. Yeah. Then you're talking maritime law. You're talking about certain regulations. It is not a simple thing. So therefore, there's no way you can do that without governmental assistance. Yes, because yes. the regulatory controls that you need, you know, there are shipping laws. There, there's yes, so, so many, many things yes. that you have to consider mm -hmm. if you're talking about operating a vessel. So therefore, there's no way the government can simply throw their hands up in the air and say, well, what is the private sector doing? In other words, you as the government, you need to put the systems in place, make sure that the fundamentals are there. You need to take the lead and then say, well, okay, look, we have two ferries running, but there's room for a third one. Mm -hmm. If the private sector is interested, maybe they could okay. invest in a boat. Yeah. And, yeah, but you must have the mm -hmm. basic system there. In other words, it's like you're trying to say, look, let's run a, a, a train. But the government does not put down a railroad and says, well, private sector, why, you not, why don't you run a train? <laughs> yes. right. Where, what are you running the train on? Exactly. You know, you need to put down the infrastructure, put down the railroad, put down the stations, mm -hmm. put down the filling bays, put down everything, put down the stops and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then you could say, look, look, we have a train running. You could buy an next train. But you need to put down the basic fundamental Excellent. infrastructure. Okay. So now... So now that we've thrown that idea out the window, sorry. <laughs> I think she wanted to throw your idea no, out long no, time. No, she wanted to throw it out long time. No, 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 no. I want to make it clear. Right, right, right. Not that I want to throw it out, <laughs> but I really, I, I told him this morning, I feel particularly cheated. Yes. Because I feel we have hired you to do a job. Mm -hmm. Get one. She did say that. Get yeah. something right. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. for God's yeah. sake. Yeah. Get yeah. something yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, know, you know, the thing is, I, I also think, you know, I mean, and I'm not a politician. I don't ever really? invent any <laughs> politics, but... Well, the thing is, I think that Poland the optics say before the end of the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the optics don't look good when you have a scenario where the prime minister, mm. who is. I think they said he's from Tobago. I, I haven't seen any proof um, in terms of how he behaves. 
to convince well, that's me what of that. Political no, satire. Not, uh, what the, the election? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, 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 that's what I heard. So, so, so you're but saying he's you, supposed to claim to be a good president at, at this, given the crisis that we are facing? No, but not just that. The thing that. is, you are supposed to have an mm. understanding. At and least. some sort of empathy yes. and an innate analysis of the Tobago situation. Yes. It can't be that you fly over to play golf, to stay in the prime minister's residence, and then you just callously say, well, I didn't see food shortages. Did you go to Pennywise? Did you go to Bill Brown supermarket? No, you don't go in those places because you are the prime minister. Right. Food is brought to you. It's put on the table for Beautiful. you. Beautiful. You don't have any clue as to how it gets there. Mm -hmm. It's placed there for you. When you go down to uh, Magdalena to play golf, how, the lunch is served. It's food? brought to right. you. So Beautiful. you wouldn't see any food shortage. So, you know, I mean, I, I just felt, mm -hmm. and I mean, as I say, I, I don't okay. ever vent here near politics, but it just did not look good mm -hmm. uh, just as an observer that this is your reaction when you are seeing mm -hmm. persons, hundreds and thousands of people turned away every day at the port people lining up waiting for eight and ten hours mm -hmm. and the port authority let me tell you they are a total mess mm -hmm. you can go online purchase tickets they're selling tickets for sailings that they don't even have sailings that they've cancelled they're still selling tickets for those and then on top of that when you try to get a refund they tell you well no you can't get a refund you have to go down to the port join a line fill out several forms and then they tell you call them back in three weeks so every time you purchase an online ticket and they ticket. cancel their sailing, it's almost impossible mm -hmm. for you to get a refund. Then you sit at the port waiting. They can give you no announcement as to when the boat is going to sail. They keep telling you, hold on, hold no, on. No, wait, Mr. Wait. George. If you're in Trinidad, you sit at the port. If you're in Tobago, you stand up like... Oh, yes. Uh, well, yeah, true. On that note, true. we take a break. <laughs> when we come back, we talk more about the boat yes. and, and lots of other situations facing Tobago viewers. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. on Pulse 89.5. Thank you for staying with us. It is now 7.17 in the morning. Yes, we have work to go to, so I know the conversation is <laughs> heating up nicely, yes. and you want to grab a cup of coffee, or in my case, a butler something, and sit down and watch, but we had a good work. <laughs> Mr. George, we were saying, now that we have, now that we dealt with Brother B's mm -hmm. um, suggestion, which is a <laughs> great Brother suggestion. No. no, no, no. Mr. The, the George, is, you yourself. There, there's no difficulty yeah. with the private sector playing a role. Yes, But of you course. cannot ask them to relieve a crisis. To do the work no. of yeah. government. Okay. Right. If that's the case, then let the persons who are in government get out and let the private sector run the government. Well, okay. if, if, that, if that's of the course. point. So, in other words, you must do your fundamentals and then when you lay the groundwork and you put the infrastructure in place, look at, for instance, Point Leases. That's a classic example. The government had to take the lead to lay down the infrastructure for that, and then they would invite the private sector and say, well, look, come in mm -hmm. and now do your thing. Cove in Tobago is another example of that kind of thing. I mean, it hasn't taken off the way it should have, but the point is you could not tell the private sector to go, go and develop Cove. And all right, well, 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 I'm um, you're talking acquisition of yeah. estates and all, but all kinds of things. But you get the sense that... This is like a, it's almost like a, a, a man-made crisis so that maybe some kind of irresponsible decision will have to be made in a, in a term to, in, let's say, to rescue Tobago from this, from this melee. We just make some crazy, some crazy um, solutions available to us. Right. And it's going to cost it, 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 the country. It makes you wonder, yes, really and truly, course. if the whole situation hasn't been artificially contrived. Very good. Right. And right. you ask yourself, mm -hmm. if that's the case, then who stands to benefit? Very good. All right, Mr. George, I've heard you on this very program when I used to be a viewer. 
You spoke <laughs> about seaplanes and so on. I don't I have a, yeah. a memory that yeah. is, I mean, give our <laughs> elephants some trouble. All right, so, um, and you spoke to that, and that is the point I'm making about alternative mm -hmm. travel to Trinidad right. and Tobago. We cannot underplay that, given the crisis that yes. we face, otherwise yes. we'll find ourselves in that down the road further. Right. But I just wanted to close off on that, because I want to go to Ivor Archie's um, okay. crisis as well. All right. So, uh, okay, the, the, yeah, and it, it's something I've said. For Tobagonians who need to go to Port of Spain for business purposes, a seaplane service is essential. Thank you. From Scarborough, landing you straight in Port of Spain. Mm -hmm. If you try to get to any appointment in Port of Spain from, for 8 o'clock, you can never make it taking that first flight at the Crown Point Airport. Mm -hmm. The flight leaves at 6.40. By the time you land in Piaco, by the time you fight up with the traffic going down the Churchill Roosevelt Highway. Forget it. Forget it. Right. If you reach Port of Spain by nine. quarter to nine, nine o'clock, you're lucky. Right. So the point is, to facilitate business, we must have a seaplane service. And I'll tell you, who it's is a seaplane service. Let me ask you, not interrupt you, but who, uh, you just said we can't have uh, private sector asking them to take up the, the mantle or the burden. Now, how do you, who is going to run the service? A but private the sector is, or... If the government doesn't want to do it, then the government has to put the fundamentals in place. Because if you're talking about seaplane service, mm -hmm. you're talking about you have to have place for fueling, you have to make sure there's safe provision for landing, you have mm -hmm. to make sure there's compliance with the maritime laws, you have to make sure yes. there's provision for the ground services, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, as I say, the government can put the infrastructure in mm -hmm. place and then invite the private sector, but the government has to take the lead. And, and we have to start thinking of, outside the box in terms of, of these things. of the actual vessels. Right, right. right. all those okay. things. All those facilitate, things. You, may, yeah. you may give um, some tax breaks, that kind of thing, exactly. to incentivize mm -hmm. it. Yes, yes, yes. So this is what you need to do. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you why it's so important. Because you're saying that, look, you're not bringing any luggage. Mm -hmm. So in other words, no, no cargo, no luggage. Right. So you have a briefcase, mm -hmm. or you have a knapsack, mm -hmm. or you just have a bag in your You're hand, for that's day. all. It's Good. only hand luggage. Good. Nothing that is, you know, basically luggage should go in a luggage compartment. Right. And you do that. It's good for persons who are coming from Trinidad to Tobago for the day. Listen, every morning, I mean, because I take the first flight regularly, mm -hmm. there's so many persons who come up for business. But the point is, you have to fight up and get to Piaco very early, take that first flight. When you land, you have to come up to Scarborough, then when you finish, you have to then head back down to Crown right. Point. So it's best to By the time you land in yeah. Piaco, mm -hmm. there's nothing you could do for the rest of the day because by the time you fight up to reach back to Port of Spain, that's your day oh. done. If we have a service that goes straight from Port of Spain to Tobago, to, um, from Scarborough to Port of Spain, yeah, even capital. THA mm -hmm. representatives who may have to go down for business, they could go down, Very good. take an early flight, land in Port of Spain, in get their business done, yeah. get a flight in Port of Spain, <laughs> back land up. back in yes. Scarborough, and yeah. still go to our office exactly. and still get work right. done. Mr. Mr. So Mr. George. They, they, they are all the benefits good. of that. Then now that is a supplement to your exactly. service at Kong Point, exactly. between Kong Point and Piaco. Mm -hmm. So therefore that by itself eases a whole lot of the congestion. Yes. And then with that, if you get a proper ferry service, and I'll, I'll tell you another thing. Why haven't we looked at having hovercrafts running between Trinidad and Tobago as our Speak. ferry service? Because I'll tell you, the hovercraft, first of all, is faster. Mm -hmm. No rough ride. So persons who may not want to take the boat because of seasickness, they have no fears with a hovercraft. All right, just, just explain, Mr. Over George, the water. just Wait, explain what that is. Hovercrafts can take cars, vans. I mean, the technology is there. Mr. Why George. are we behaving as if we are living in the dark ages? Right. Mr. George, one minute. Let them, let the view, you see, you can talk and you can fly over Sorry. people's head. <laughs> let us talk what a horrorcraft is. It's a, it's a military type vessel. It works on the sea. It, it's like a big, if you want to call it, pillow that keeps a vessel afloat. It's like a floating air. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's air. Yeah. And there's no bump, air. there's no ride. Now, those exist in Canada and where else in the world? Um, Holland, Holland has a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. So, and so, so this is what we're speaking to. We're speaking to alternative. You mentioned the seaplane, and I spoke about private investors, and however, somebody has to take up the bulk of that. We can mm -hmm. spend the entire morning talking about new ideas, mm -hmm. but, and they're not paying us for that. So the government is listening. <laughs> so here we're sending them the bill. We're sending them the bill. No, I, 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 I hope they're listening, and, and I don't mind them listening exactly. for free. All right. If they would implement some of the things. Before we lo time run out on us, I want to, because we were discussing this earlier this morning, I heard... Uh, Lawrence Mirage made or called a press conference and shut down your colleagues who was calling for the head of Ivor Archie, Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, let us talk about the appointment of 
a magistrate to a judge, given and the crux of the argument by his, well, those who want the head of this young man, the argument is that this sitting magistrate have too many matters so as to be elevated, um, to, uh, be elevated from magistrate to judge. Speak to us and bring clarity so that we can clearly understand. You, I trust, <laughs> have the wisdom. All right. The thing is, um, the Miss A. Caesar, she was the chief magistrate. She was appointed as a judge Good. of the high court. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the Constitution, there are several protections which give a judge tenure, independence, and the security from being arbitrarily removed. Now, I don't know who was advising Miss A. Caesar. But this was a scenario where if she was, I guess, advised differently, I'll say, she could have exercised the option to say, I've been appointed, I'm not moving. As magistrate? No, as judge. Uh -huh. You see, uh -huh. once you appoint someone as a judge, their security of tenure protects and insulates them, and you have to go through a whole procedure. Mm -hmm. And that's what Mr. Maraj spoke to Good. in terms of the Constitution. There's right. a whole procedure if you want to remove a judge. So in other words, had she taken an alternative path mm -hmm. and said, I am not resigning, I am not moving... There's nothing they could have done. Well, not that there is nothing, the but it would have created such a conundrum for the JLSC that they would have been hard-pressed to even try to invoke those provisions to move her. Okay. What did but, Ivor Archie do wrong? Why they are calling for his head oh, well, in that appointment? Well, the thing is, um, I, I wouldn't personalize it to him because okay, it's a whole commission. It's a system. Right. It's the Judicial and Legal Services Commission. Right. And I think what people are saying is that, look, as a commission, you have a duty to do your own due diligence in the matter. So it's not just a matter of saying that, look, you spoke to her and she represented ABC and then you found out it was XYZ. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to get the facts, to call upon the um, you know, office holders to say, well, look, you provide this information and verify for yourself. Mm -hmm. Every year at the opening of the law term, we get all the statistics as to how many cases have been right. completed, how many cases Good. are pending. Yeah. So in other words, you so, have the ability to get that right. information. So the information was not, I don't want to say forwarded to the Chief Justice, so as to know how many cases uh, 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 Master S. Caesar had backlog or cases in the back that mm -hmm. needed to be cleared so as to have this lady appointed to this position. Is it a case of information was not given to the Chief Justice or the, JDC, the system that, 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 that he is head of uh, so, uh, for the appointment to be clear or what? Well, I want to get to the, the, the meat okay, of the matter. The, the issue is that you have the ability to get the information. It's, right. for instance, if you are, say, for instance, the head of a television station mm. and you can call upon your staff and say, look, all right, I need to know how many sick days this person has taken, how many, you know. Right. And you don't do that, okay. and then you promote them, and then you find out subsequently, well, look, this person has such a bad record that they ought not to have been promoted. Oh, okay. Who do you blame right. when you had the ability to call for the information? And mm -hmm. you see, because of the constitutional remit which the JLSC has, I think that's where mm -hmm. people are saying that, look, mm -hmm. you had that primary duty mm -hmm. to find out mm -hmm. first, yes. independently, what is the true state of play? Okay. And then they, it, it gets worse because when you have a scenario that you say, well, look, she later confessed a mere culpa mm -hmm. to say, well, you know, look, I have more outstanding matters than I first represented. Mm -hmm. To stick your hands directly into the say? wound. What does that but, say? But to here's credibility. the thing. Mm -hmm. Ah, it's a credibility that's the issue. point. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you as JLSC accept that she has either deceived or misled you mm -hmm. and you believe that, then there's no way you could then seek to reappoint her as chief magistrate because this is someone who is untrustworthy, someone who cannot be believed, someone who has fooled an entire commission. Miss so therefore, how could I have faith to put you back as chief magistrate? I can't even have faith to put you back as a, 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 the most junior magistrate because your role and function has been compromised. So right, right. the conundrum mm -hmm. in which the JLSC finds itself mm -hmm. is not one from which they can easily escape. Mm -hmm. And that's where people have been you know, saying, well, look, you know, this is the scenario. But again, I have made a distinction. 
Because in Trinidad and Tobago, we very often try to make the call. People very often say, well, look, this one should resign. And I have always said, no, we must always analyze clinically yes. what's the fact scenario before you make any such assessment. Mm -hmm. And I've said it, and I will say it again. We must divorce the role and functioning of someone in your capacity as chairman of JLSC and your role and functioning as chief justice. Because I don't think there's anyone who has made any criticism or found any fault with just Chief Justice Archie as a as, judicial mm -hmm. officer mm -hmm. and as Chief Justice in that role as head of the judiciary. Right. So if you wish to say, well, look, there's been a failing in a role as JLSC, then limit your criticism to oh, that. Very good. Okay. Right. So you find broad. I mean, go. They've broadened the ambit of it. Well, they've broadened the ambit of it, and they've said, "Well, he should resign." I tell you. Okay. And that's where I say, "No, it can't be." All right. Okay. So as we can <laughs> see, the, the conversation is heating up, <laughs> and I have to try and part the waters here. But we'll hold on and. and Stay tuned, viewers, so we can get to the bottom of this once and for all, according to Martin George. <laughs> we'll see you after the news. So stay tuned. Welcome back, viewers and listeners on Pulse 89.5. It is now 7.44 here in Tobago. So if you have to get to work for 8 o'clock, I hope you've gotten on your way because it's only <laughs> me that's stuck in traffic for an hour in Tobago. Really? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So <laughs> let's get back to where we left off, Mr. George. And you were speaking mm -hmm. to whether it was, well, I'm putting it in this way now, whether it was founded. Uh, to call for the head of the Chief Justice, Ivor Archie. Given, well, you outlined uh, who uh, is to be blamed. It's a system that really, um, and again, uh, speaking to the old question of when Marcia A. Caesar realized that she had other matters that she did not declare, that question, her credibility as whether she's worthy or not to become a judge. I wanted to take it from there, given um, the call for whether it was justifiable to call for the Chief Justice head as a result of Mm, a lack of information meeting to him and uh, as to relate to how we treat with appointing a magistrate to a judge. I just want to recap that and to just finish off the statement on that. All right. I just want to make a distinction. Mm -hmm. The responsibility remains with the JLSC. Right. So in other words, and it, I, I'm saying that quite clearly, they had the responsibility to ensure that thorough checks and balances of were course. made. Right. The GLC. Right? The GLC. So regardless of what she may have represented or not represented, you also had the ability, the means, to be able to independently verify. Mm -hmm. Okay? So let's lay that make as that a ground. Good. What we need to make another distinction about is your functioning as a judicial officer as the president of the Court of Appeal and the Chief Justice, for which, as I say, nobody can raise any serious doubt or question at all in terms of competence, um, his judicial acumen and stuff like that. So therefore, that's why I say the cause for saying that he must step down as Chief Justice appear respectfully to be misconstrued and misaligned Very with good. the facts. Great. So while I think it is open to persons to call into scrutiny what was done at the JLSC, let's remember that he's there, first of all, ex officio, by virtue of the office of Chief Justice, mm -hmm. you are chairman of the JLSC. Good. So it's a function of you being Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. Your role and function in there has nothing to do with your ability as a Chief Justice in a judicial capacity. Very so good. therefore, However, Martin, right. however, Martin mm -hmm. if it is ex officio, as you, as you said, and I'm sure it is, um, 
then maybe that is why they're calling for the head, for his head as as chief justice, because then it would mean if you if you cannot competently carry right. out your role. Yes, here, I know, I understand. Then that. If we cut you off here, which which is automatically an then yeah, right. Yes, and because that, you can't that, pick one or the other. That's the argument that has been made. But what I'm saying is that we need to dissect the matter and analyze it in the sense that look, you cannot fault what will be otherwise a stellar judicial career for something you have maybe done wrong in an administrative capacity in another role. And I think we have to make that distinction. I, 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 I'm very serious, because you also have on the JLSC the chairman of the Public Services Commission. By extension, if we take that argument to its logical conclusion, mm -hmm. then that person would also have to resign as chairman of the Public Service Commission, even though she simply sits there ex officio also. So while you can fault someone for a role and function in another capacity, unless it's such an egregious error that you say, well, look, it now goes to the question of either the character or the basic fundamental competence of that person right. as a public official, right. then I think we ought to separate the two of the jurisdiction. Let's stay on the judiciary right. system for a while. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Maraj, in one of his statements, I think in 2016, spoke of the judiciary system as fractured, as, as standing on the edge of a Precipice, precipice. <laughs> and looking to head down. I think we're at the bottom of the precipice now, yeah? <laughs> Safely we can see that because it's no longer fractured. This mm -hmm. slim crack yes. is now an all-out yeah, yes. mm -hmm. um, broken-down system. Mm -hmm. um, as of last year as well, there was a need for a hundred person, a hundred persons to be hired mm -hmm. to help clear off some of the back backlog. But we're seeing people being hired uh, for tax collection, 200, <laughs> they say. All kind of stuff, right? But we can't get personnel for the judiciary system mm -hmm. to work properly so that we can actually get a handle on some crime mm -hmm. here. How do you see Mr. Archie's rule, or does it have anything right. at all to do now, with that? So in that case, mm -hmm. you can then engage in the analysis of his management of the judiciary Mm -hmm. And if you find fault or failing, then of course you call upon him to account. Do you and find fault in or that failing? sense, um, there are many ways that it can be improved. I've, I've said so openly. There yes. are many ways. Look, you just look at Tobago. Look at the magistrates' court. I have said repeatedly. I have complained. In fact, every time I go in that magistrates' court, I apologize to members of the public. I mean, it's not my role or responsibility, but I just feel, feel so bad badly for them. Mm -hmm. They are herded like cattle, yes. standing up there for hours. You know, they have no facilities and not even a little coffee shop, they can't get a sandwich. You have mothers who come in there with children because they come in for maintenance, this, that, the other. They have nowhere to put the children. They did, so they did, the children crying, they're hungry. I mean, it is just intolerable right. that in the year 2017, this is what we have to put up with. You know, look, even now there's now an issue with the parking because the wreckers are now making rounds, <laughs> circling the courts <laughs> and picking up all the cars. <laughs> Attorneys don't have parking places. <laughs> Members of the public don't have yes. parking places. The staff don't have adequate parking. So therefore, there are many things yes. that you need to fix okay. immediately. And let me tell you, a lot of these things, they don't require major fixes. Okay? Mm. Like, for instance, you just look up at the high court there. You have additional space that you could, okay, you could reduce some of the lawn area and create additional parking. That, that's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I've said repeatedly, even simple things like providing wireless service for persons at the courts. Attorneys may have to do research. Magistrates may have to do research. These are simple things. I've said also, you can provide each magistrate with a research officer who is an attorney. So therefore, while the magistrate is sitting at the, on the bench, the attorney is there as a the research officer. So therefore, somebody may be making a submission and you need to check something. 
a person could be yeah, checking yeah. it, so, right, feed the so magistrate the information so in real time. Yes. Instead of what happens where somebody makes a submission, then the magistrate has to adjourn the matter for a month or two. Then when the magistrate has time, the magistrate then has to now go do yeah. the research. So, Mr. George, no, that speaks directly simple things. to and that's yeah. the management of the Perfect. judiciary. Exactly. Now, now, the magistrate, uh, Master uh, Caesar, could have... I don't want to say genuinely, not know that she had matters pending up until she was called up. Because <laughs> what you spoke to, there is no one or no individual to tell her, Madam, you know, we have 10 cases um, that is still pending and um, you need to see how fast you can get rid of these cases because uh, based on what is put in place by the GLSC. Yes? No, if no, that... no, no, sorry. You, you, you've you asked your question. Don't answer it first, <laughs> <sir>. <laughs> well, Because well, I allowed please. you Good. all the rope simply because you were just hanging yourself. That right. makes absolutely no sense. No. Each what? magistrate will know uh -huh. but in no, real time no, yeah. how many cases right. you they just have spoke to, You spoke to something that would have speed I up. I spoke this. to research uh -huh. in terms of legal submission. That's right. a totally different but thing. But a magistrate will know how many cases she has pending. Of course. So when she submitted to the chief justice or the JLC that, listen, I have this amount, and then later on she came back and said, no, it's, it's X amount. How can a mistake like that, this is what I'm getting to, can be made by such a legal mind or somebody that you think is competent it to. It doesn't seem to. possible that that can be a an mistake oversight. that you would make one oversight. What is that? And then again, uh -huh. as I say, it doesn't seem rational that the JLSC for themselves did not do their own independent verification. Mm -hmm. So therefore, in other words, there's enough blame to share around equally. Very, okay. But it seems all to be going in one direction only. But she came forth and she, you know, confessed basically That's, to mm -hmm. her part. But I think that if we engage in some mature introspection and reflection, you'd realize that it couldn't just be one-sided in terms of the responsibility okay. and culpability. Very good. All right. Um, time is going to run out on us, and we need to talk a little bit about land taxes and the tax issues in Tobago. <laughs> so we don't have enough time to talk about these issues. We, we, uh, and, and I'm not even done with that whole yeah. question of the Ivarachi story. But however, let's move along. Um, land issues in Tobago, property tax. Now, the evaluation. Um, a regular house, two-bedroom, whatever, he is or his owner of that property will pay $80, $91 per month. Um, the evaluation. Now, what are the protections. And of course, there's punishment if you don't conform. There's a deadline date. I think it's uh, sometime in next week, week, Monday. Next week, Monday. Yeah. Speak to us about people's rights and what are the ramifications if there's no um, protection for ordinary citizens. Well, the thing is, I think that there are some fundamental issues that are going to be examined in terms of the property tax legislation. First of all, as to its constitutionality. Because it affects the right of persons in terms of their ownership and enjoyment of property, and that's a fundamental right protected by the Constitution. And generally in the Constitution, it says that if you are to change or amend anything that touches or concerns these fundamental provisions, you must have special majorities. Mm -hmm. If that legislation was passed without that special majority, I think that opens the way for a constitutional challenge. I understand that there are attorneys who have written right. a pre-action protocol letter and mm -hmm. they intend to mount a constitutional challenge. Mm -hmm. There's also another set that has planned to mount a judicial review um, application, so they are challenging it on that basis too. So I, I think mm -hmm. that the minute any of those matters enters the courtroom, there will be a stay on the imposition or levying okay. of right. the property tax okay. because we must get these issues clarified oh, first, you know? Yeah. I mean, I know there are some who have said that, look, it's just a tactic by the opposition because you, you look at the lineup of attorneys and, of course, it does appear to have a political flavor. Mm -hmm. But the thing is we must understand that, look, in analyzing things, regardless of whether it may have a political slant or political bias, let's look at the core fundamental issues. Yes. If it is that something was not done properly, mm -hmm. then we need to fix it, okay. regardless of who benefits politically from this scenario. Okay. So the fact is, we can safely say the government is acting too quickly, has not done its homework on more than one counts. 
where well, the thing is, is concerned. No, the, the point is, the, the blame is, is to be shared equally. Because mm -hmm. if you recall, the UNC yes, of course. were also eight, in right? government, and they never did anything to rectify it. So mm -hmm. the point is, we, we have to be careful in terms of ascribing blame. Right. What and I'm say, saying, well, but look, the government of the day is well, the one who right. is now saying, let us Seeking do it, implement let it. us mm -hmm. implement. So right. we can't not, say... Not just that. I'll tell you, you know, sometimes, I mean, I, I, I'm so happy I stay so far from politics right. because... I think the way they think and function sometimes is very strange because if you wanted to reintroduce the idea of property tax, the simplest and most palatable way to have done so would be to say, look, people, all right, we need to change the system. Nobody argues with that. Then, okay, years ago, you used to pay like maybe $10, $20 for your house. Mm. And you just say, okay, look, we're starting with doubling that. Right. Nobody Excellent. in Trinidad and Tobago would complain. And then you say, look, every year, it's going to go up by 10%. So mm -hmm. you make gradual... Go so in order to get it done with no fuss, no wow. bother, everybody yes, will yes, comply, right. yes. and you will eventually get your yes, revenue. Yes. And you, you avoid all this political grandstanding yes. whereby you have the Minister of Finance going in Parliament and saying there will be no extension. So in other words, you, you, in these times, hmm. it doesn't appear to me politically expedient to try to shove attacks like this down th people's throats you don't in the manner take that and cool it yes no, in the I manner in the manner that they are will. approaching it yes, and yes, i yes. wonder why you go about it this way you simply use the system you have now yeah, yeah, right since 2009 because yeah. 2009 is the last year yeah, or 2010 pay. right and you simply say well, look we doubling that. Mm -hmm. Everybody will run and pay. Exactly. Nobody's going to make any. And then you say, look, yeah. every year that's going to go up ten percent. Exactly. And so exactly. eventually you're going to get it up to a realistic level, mm -hmm. and it's nice and that's easy, true. and you avoid all this confrontation. Now what you have ended up doing is politicizing the issue hmm. by trying to force it on the population. Then the opposition now is filing court action, yes, yes, yes. and then now the whole thing is polarized. And you've seen all the comments, and everything is now politically mm -hmm. polarized by saying, well, look. Is the government trying to do this? Is the opposition trying to stop it? Why, why, why do we make governance so difficult for things that can be seen in this scenario? But I think it's because they see things from their political lenses, whereas we, fortunately, are, are not we so have, constrained. Closing, we have to close in just a few seconds. But do you sense at the moment that there's sort of a political, what I would call, um, desperation? Do you sense that at all with everything and that's happening? Mm -hmm. Well, when it's a desperation on whose side? Well, I mean, to get things right, we, we, we are operating with no money or little money, according to what they're saying. Um, so well, it, now we not, have to get not, money, the criminal justice system. I would say it's, it's a matter of system. political desperation. I think what we have seen is a government that they had a plan to win the election, but post-election victory, we are yet to see a clear, credible plan. And I think that's all the people of Trinidad and Tobago want right now. In other words, exhibit some leadership. Let's look at things constructively. Let's say, okay, look, for the economy, people, we're in a mess. And let's forget the blame game for a bit, mm -hmm. you know, because we spent a year and a half blaming people. Right. So let's now forget the blame and let's Unrun show the, the way forward. Right. Let's say, okay, look, we are at the bottom of the barrel economically. However, this is our comprehensive plan whereby we can move forward. You set out the parameters, you lay the, the building blocks, and let me tell you, the nation will buy into that exactly. if you do that. Mm -hmm. But when you are there and all you are doing is pointing fingers and throwing stones at each other across the aisles in Parliament, and you're throwing words for each other and you're throwing pekong, then the population must get frustrated and feel, well, look, you all are just wasting time. You know, even on crime, they ought to be able to show some kind of credible plan or policy to say, well, okay, look, these are the steps we are taking, and you communicate with the people that way. It mm -hmm. can't be that you think that just by winning an election, then that's all you need to do, and well, you know, if you don't like it, you know, Take lump, it, lump it. it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you know? It, it just doesn't <laughs> seem to me like it. to be the best yes. way to govern Excellent. a nation such all as right. Trinidad and Tobago. Thank it's you a pleasure, so Mr. Much, George. So Mr. much, George. we got so much, man. <laughs> I tell you, always, always a pleasure. Such a pleasure always having nice. you. Nice. Uh, viewers and listeners, stay tuned. Just up after the break, we are going to be joined on set by Mr. Avery Seaton. And we're going to talk about Men of Exile. We're going to spend a little time rem reminiscing about our dear friend, Rennie Dumas. See you after the break.